a dynamite explosion. Dupre sat at one of the round tables in the Café Vernon with a glass of absinthe before him, which he sipped every now and again. He looked through the open door out to the boulevard and saw passing back and forth with the regularity of a pendulum a uniformed policeman. Dupre laughed silently as he noticed this evidence of law and order. The Café Vernon was under the protection of the government. The class to which Dupre belonged had sworn that it would blow the café into the next world. Therefore, the military-looking policeman walked to and fro on the pavement to prevent this being done, so that all honest citizens might see that the government protects its own. People were arrested now and then for lingering around the café. They were innocent, of course, and by and by, the government found that out and let them go. The real criminal seldom acts suspiciously. Most of the arrested persons were merely attracted by curiosity. There, said one to another, the notorious Herzog was arrested. The real criminal goes quietly into the café and orders his absinthe, as Dupre had done and the policeman marches up and down, keeping an eye on the guiltless. So runs the world. There were few customers in the café, for people feared the vengeance of Herzog's friends. They expected some fine day that the café would be blown to atoms, and they preferred to be taking their coffee and cognac somewhere else when that time came. It was evident that Monsieur Sonne, the proprietor of the café had done a poor stroke of business for himself when he gave information to the police regarding the whereabouts of Herzog, notwithstanding the fact that his café became suddenly the most noted one in the city and that it now enjoyed the protection of the government. Dupre seldom looked at the proprietor who sat at the desk, nor at the waiter who had helped the week before to overpower Herzog. He seemed more intent on watching the minion of the law who paced back and forth in front of the door, although he once glanced at the other minion who sat almost out of sight at the back of the café, scrutinizing all who came in, especially those who had parcels of any kind. The café was well guarded, and Monsieur Son, at the desk, appeared to be satisfied with the protection he was receiving. When customers did come in, they seldom sat at the round metal tables, but went direct to the zinc-covered bar, ordered their fluid, and drank it standing, seeming in a hurry to get away. They nodded to Monsieur Son, and were evidently old frequenters of the café, who did not wish him to think that they had deserted him in this crisis. Nevertheless, they all had engagements that made prompt departure necessary. Dupre smiled grimly when he noticed this. He was the only man sitting at a table. He had no fears of being blown up. He knew that his comrades were more given to high talk than to action. He had not attended the last meeting, for he more than suspected the police had agents among them. Besides, his friend and leader, Herzog, had never attended meetings. That was why the police had had such difficulty in finding him. Herzog had been a man of deeds, not words. He had said to Dupre once that a single determined man who kept his mouth shut could do more against society than all the secret associations ever formed. And his own lurid career had proved the truth of this. But now he was in prison, and it was the treachery of Monsieur Son that had sent him there. As he thought of this, Dupre cast a glance at the proprietor and gritted his teeth. The policeman at the back of the hall, feeling lonely perhaps, walked to the door and nodded to his parading comrade. The other paused for a moment on his beat, and they spoke to each other. As the policeman turned to his place, Dupre said to him, Have a sip with me. Not while on duty, 
replied the officer with a wink. Garçon, said Dupre quietly, bring me a carafe of brandy, fin champagne. The garçon placed the little Marc decanter on the table with two glasses. Dupre filled them both. The policeman, with a rapid glance over his shoulder, tossed one off and smacked his lips. Dupre slowly sipped the other while he asked, Do you anticipate any trouble here? Not in the least, answered the officer confidently. Talk, that's all. I thought so, said Dupre. They had a meeting the other night, a secret meeting. The policeman smiled a little as he said this. They talked a good deal. They are going to do wonderful things. A man was detailed to carry out this job. And have you arrested him? questioned Dupre. Oh dear, no. We watch him merely. He is the most frightened man in the city tonight. We expect him to come and tell us all about it, but we hope he won't. We know more about it than he does. I dare say. Still, it must have hurt Monsieur Son's business a good deal. It has killed it for the present. People are such cowards. But the government will make it all right with him out of the secret fund. He won't lose anything. Does he own the whole house or only the cafe? The whole house. He lets the upper rooms, but nearly all the tenants have left. Yet I call it the safest place in the city. They are all poltroons, the dynamiters, and they are certain to strike at some place not so well guarded. They are all well known to us, and the moment one is caught prowling about here, he will be arrested. They are too cowardly to risk their liberty by coming near this place. It's a different thing from leaving a tin can and fuse in some dark corner when nobody is looking. Any fool can do that. Then you think this would be a good time to take a room here? I am looking for one in this neighborhood, said Dupre. You couldn't do better than arrange with Monsieur Son. You could make a good bargain with him now and you would be perfectly safe. I am glad you mentioned it. I will speak to Monsieur Son tonight and see the rooms tomorrow. Have another sip of brandy? No, thank you. I must be getting back to my place. Just tell Monsieur Son, if you take a room, that I spoke to you about it. I will. Good night. Dupre paid his bill and tipped the garçon liberally. The proprietor was glad to hear of anyone wanting rooms. It showed the tide was turning and an appointment was made for next day. Dupre kept his appointment and the concierge showed him over the house. The back rooms were too dark, the windows being but a few feet from the opposite wall. The lower front rooms were too noisy. Dupre said that he liked quiet being a student. A front room on the third floor, however, pleased him, and he took it. He well knew the necessity of being on good terms with the concierge, who would spy on him anyhow, so he paid just a trifle more than requisite to that functionary, but not enough to arouse suspicion. Too much is as bad as too little, a fact that Dupre was well aware of. He had taken pains to see that his window was directly over the front door of the cafe, but now that he was alone and the door locked, he scrutinized the position more closely. There was an awning over the front of the cafe that shut off his view of the pavement and the policeman marching below. That complicated matters. Still, he remembered that when the sun went down, the awning was rolled up. His first idea when he took the room was to drop the dynamite from the third story window to the pavement below. But the more he thought of that plan, the less he liked it. 
It was the sort of thing any fool could do, as the policeman had said. It would take some thinking over. Besides, dynamite dropped on the pavement would, at most, but blow in the front of the shop, kill the perambulating policeman, perhaps, or some innocent passer-by, but it would not hurt old son, nor yet the garçon who had made himself so active in arresting Herzog. Dupre was a methodical man. He spoke quite truly when he said he was a student. He now turned his student training on the case as if it were a problem in mathematics. First, the dynamite must be exploded inside the café. Second, the thing must be done so deftly that no suspicion could fall on the perpetrator. Third, revenge was no revenge when it A. killed the man who fired the mine, or B. left a trail that would lead to his arrest. Dupre sat down at his table, thrust his hands in his pockets, stretched out his legs, knit his brows, and set himself to solve the conundrum. He could easily take a handbag filled with explosive material into the café. He was known there, but not as a friend of Herzog's. He was a customer and a tenant, therefore doubly safe. But he could not leave the bag there, and if he stayed with it, his revenge would rebound on himself. He could hand the bag to the waiter, saying he would call for it again, but the waiter would naturally wonder why he did not give it to the concierge and have it sent to his rooms. Besides, the garçon was wildly suspicious. The waiter felt his unfortunate position. He dare not leave the café Vernon, for he now knew that he was a marked man. At the Vernon, he had police protection, while if he went anywhere else, he would have no more safeguard than any other citizen. So he stayed at the Vernon, such a course being, he thought, the least of two evils. But he watched every incomer much more sharply than did the policeman. Dupre also realized that there was another difficulty about the handbag scheme. The dynamite must be set off either by a fuse or by clockwork machinery. A fuse caused smoke, and the moment a man touched a bag containing clockwork, his hand felt the thrill of moving machinery. A man who hears for the first time the buzz of the rattlesnake signal, like the shaking of dry peas in a pod, springs instinctively aside, even though he knows nothing of snakes. How much more, therefore, would a suspicious waiter, whose nerves were all alert for the soft, dreary purr of dynamite mechanism, spoil everything the moment his hand touched the bag? Yes, Dupre reluctantly admitted to himself, the handbag theory was not practical. It led to either self-destruction or prison. What then was the next thing? as fuse or mechanism were unavailable. There was the bomb that exploded when it struck, and Dupre had himself made several. A man might stand in the middle of the street and shy it through the open door. But then he might miss the doorway. Also, until the hour the café closed, the street was as light as day. Then the policeman was all alert for people in the middle of the street. His own safety depended upon it, too. How was the man in the street to be dispensed with, yet the result attained? If the boulevard was not so wide, a person on the opposite side in a front room might fire a dynamite bomb across, as they do from dynamite guns. But then there was... By God! cried Dupree. I have it! He drew in his outstretched legs, went to the window and threw it open, gazing down for a moment at the pavement below. He must measure the distance at night, and late at night too, he said to himself. He bought a ball of cord as nearly the color of the front of the building as possible. 
he left his window open and after midnight ran the cord out till he estimated that it about reached the top of the cafe door. He stole quietly down and let himself out, leaving the door unlatched. The door to the apartments was at the extreme edge of the building, while the cafe doors were in the middle, with large windows on each side. As he came round to the front, his heart almost ceased to beat when a voice from the cafe door said, What do you want? What are you doing here at this hour? The policeman had become so much a part of the pavement in Dupre's mind that he had actually forgotten the officer was there night and day. Dupre allowed himself the luxury of one silent gasp, then his heart took up its work again. I was looking for you, he said quietly. By straining his eyes, he noticed at the same moment that the cord dangled about a foot above the policeman's head as he stood in the dark doorway. I was looking for you. I suppose you don't know of any, any chemist shop open so late as this? I have a raging toothache and can't sleep and I want to get something for it. Oh, the chemist at the corner is open all night. Ring the bell at the right hand. I hate to disturb them for such a trifle. That's what they're there for, said the officer philosophically. Would you mind standing at the door till I get back? I'll be as quick as I can. I don't wish to leave it open unprotected, and I don't want to close it, for the concierge knows I'm in, and he's afraid to open it when anyone rings late. You know me, of course. I'm in number 16. Yes, I recognize you now, though I didn't at first. I will stand by the door until you return. Dupre went to the corner shop and bought a bottle of toothache drops from the sleepy youth behind the counter. He roused him up, however, and made him explain how the remedy was to be applied. He thanked the policeman, closed the door, and went up to his room. A second later, the cord was cut at the window and quietly pulled in. Dupre sat down and breathed hard for a few moments. So, a mistake or two like that, you are doomed. That's what comes of thinking too much on one branch of your subject. Another two feet and the string would have been down on his nose. I am certain he did not see it. I could hardly see it myself, looking for it. The guarding of the side door was an inspiration, but I must think well over every phase of the subject before acting again. This is a lesson. As he went on with his preparations, it astonished him to find how many various things had to be thought of in connection with an apparently simple scheme the neglect of any one of which would endanger the whole enterprise. His plan was a most uncomplicated one. All he had to do was to tie a canister of dynamite at the end of a string of suitable length, and at night, before the cafe doors were closed, fling it from his window so that the package would sweep in by the open door, strike against the ceiling of the cafe, and explode. First, he thought of holding the end of the cord in his hand at the open window, but reflection showed him that, if in the natural excitement of the moment, he drew back or leaned too far forward, the package might strike the front of the house above the door, or perhaps hit the pavement. He therefore drove a stout nail in the window sill and attached the end of the cord to that. Again, he had to render his canister of explosives so sensitive to any shock that he realized if he tied the cord around it and flung it out into the night, the can might go off when the string was jerked tight and the explosion take place in midair above the street. So he arranged a spiral string between can and cord to take up harmlessly the shock caused by the momentum of the package when the string became suddenly taut. 
He saw that the weak part of his project was the fact that everything would depend on his own nerve and accuracy of aim at the critical moment, and that a slight miscalculation to the right or to the left would cause the bomb, when falling down and in, to miss the door altogether. He would have but one chance, and there was no opportunity of practicing. However, Dupre, who was a philosophical man, said to himself that if people allowed small technical difficulties to trouble them too much, nothing really worth doing would be accomplished in this world. He felt sure he was going to make some little mistake that would ruin all his plans, but he resolved to do the best he could and accept the consequences with all the composure at his command. As he stood by the window on the fatal night with the canister in his hand, he tried to recollect if there was anything left undone or any tracks remaining uncovered. There was no light in his room, but a fire burned in the grate, throwing flickering reflections on the opposite wall. There are four things I must do, he murmured. First, pull up the string. Second, throw it from the fire. Third, draw out the nail. Fourth, close the window. He was pleased to notice that his heart was not beating faster than usual. I think I have myself well in hand, yet I must not be too cool when I get downstairs. There are so many things to think of all at one time, he said to himself with a sigh. He looked up and down the street. The pavement was clear. He waited until the policeman had passed the door. He would take ten steps before he turned on his beat. When his back was towards the cafe door, Dupre launched his bomb out into the night. He drew back instantly and watched the nail. It held when the jerk came. A moment later, the whole building lurched like a drunken man, heaving its shoulders, as it were. Dupre was startled by a great square of plaster coming down on his table with a crash. Below, there was a roar of muffled thunder. The floor trembled under him after the heave. The glass in the window clattered down, and he felt the air smite him on the breast, as if someone had struck him a blow. He looked out for a moment. The concussion had extinguished the street lamps opposite. All was dark in front of the café, where a moment before the boulevard was flooded with light. A cloud of smoke was rolling out from the lower part of the house. Four things said Dupre, as he rapidly pulled in the cord. It was shriveled at the end. Dupre did the other three things quickly. Everything was strangely silent, although the deadened roar of the explosion still sounded dully in his ears. His boots crunched on the plaster as he walked across the room and groped for the door. He had some trouble in pulling it open, it stuck so fast that he thought it was locked. Then he remembered with a cold shiver of fear that the door had been unlocked all the time he had stood at the window with the canister in his hand. I have certainly done some careless thing like that, which will betray me yet. I wonder what it is. He wrenched the door open at last. The lights in the hall were out. He struck a match and made his way down. He thought he heard groans. As he went down, he found it was the concierge huddled in a corner. What is the matter? he asked. Oh, my God, my God, cried the concierge. I knew they would do it. We are all blown to atoms. Get up, said Dupre. You're not hurt. Come with me and see if we can be of any use. I'm afraid of another explosion, groaned the concierge. Nonsense. There's never a second. Come along. 
They found some difficulty in getting outside, and then it was through a hole in the wall and not through the door. The lower hall was wrecked. Dupre expected to find a crowd, but there was no one there. He did not realize how short a time had elapsed since the disaster. The policeman was on his hands and knees in the street, slowly getting up like a man in a dream. Dupre ran to him and helped him on his feet. Are you hurt? he asked. I don't know, said the policeman, rubbing his head in his bewilderment. How was it done? Oh, don't ask me. All at once there was a clap of thunder, and the next thing I was on my face in the street. Is your comrade inside? Yes, he and Monsieur Son and two customers. And the garçon, wasn't he there? cried Dupre with a note of disappointment in his voice. The policeman didn't notice the disappointed tone, but answered, Oh, the garçon, of course. Ah, said Dupre in a satisfied voice, let us go in and help them. Now the people had begun to gather in crowds, but kept at some distance from the cafe. Dynamite! Dynamite! they said in awed voices among themselves. A detachment of police came mysteriously from somewhere. They drove the crowd still further back. What is this man doing here? asked the chief. The policeman answered, He's a friend of ours. He lives in the house. Oh, said the chief. I was going in, said Dupre, to find my friend, the officer, on duty in the cafe. Very well, come with us. They found the policeman insensible under the debris, with a leg and both arms broken. Dupre helped to carry him out to the ambulance. Monsieur Son was breathing when they found him, but died on the way to the hospital. The garçon had been blown to pieces. The chief thanked Dupre for his assistance. They arrested many persons, but never discovered who blew up the Café Vernon, although it was surmised that some miscreant had left a bag containing an infernal machine with either the waiter or the proprietor. An Electrical Slip Public opinion has been triumphantly vindicated. The insanity plea had broken down and Albert Pryor was sentenced to be hanged by the neck until he was dead, and might the Lord have mercy on his soul. Everybody agreed that it was a righteous verdict, but now that he was sentenced, they added, Poor fellow! Albert Pryor was a young man who had had more of his own way than was good for him. His own family, father, mother, brother, and sisters, had given way to him so much that he appeared to think the world at large should do the same. The world differed with him. Unfortunately, the first to oppose his violent will was a woman, a girl almost. She would have nothing to do with him, and told him so. He stormed, of course, but did not look upon her opposition as serious. No girl in her senses could continue to refuse a young man with his prospects in life. But when he learned that she had become engaged to young Bowen, the telegraph operator, Pryor's rage passed all bounds. He determined to frighten Bowen out of the place and called at the telegraph office for that laudable purpose. But Bowen was the night operator and was absent. The day man, with a smile, not knowing what he did, said Bowen would likely be found at the Parker place, where Miss Johnson lived with her aunt, her parents being dead. Pryor ground his teeth and departed. He found Miss Johnson at home, but alone. 
There was a stormy scene, ending with a tragedy. He fired four times at her, keeping the other two bullets for himself. But he was a coward and a cur at heart, and when it came to the point of putting the two bullets in himself, he quailed and thought it best to escape. Then electricity did him its first disservice. It sent his description far and wide, capturing him 25 miles from his home. He was taken back to the county town where he lived and lodged in jail. Public opinion, ever right and all-powerful, now asserted itself. The outward and visible sign of its action was an ominous gathering of dark-browed citizens outside the jail. There were determined mutterings among the crowd rather than outspoken anger, but the mob was the more dangerous on that account. One man in its midst thrust his closed hand towards the sky and from his fist dangled a rope. A cry like the growling of a pack of wolves went up as the mob saw the rope and they clamored at the gates of the jail. Lynch him, jailer! Give up the keys! was the cry. The agitated sheriff knew his duty, but he hesitated to perform it. Technically, this was a mob, a mob of outlaws, but in reality it was composed of his fellow townsmen, his neighbors, his friends, justly indignant at the commission of an atrocious crime. He might order them to be fired upon, and the order perhaps would be obeyed. One, two, a dozen might be killed, and technically, again, they would have deserved their fate. Yet, all that perfectly legal slaughter would be, for what? To save, for a time only, the worthless life of a wretch who rightly merited any doom the future might have in store for him. So the sheriff wrung his hands, bewailed the fact that such a crisis should have arisen during his term of office, and did nothing, while the clamors of the mob grew so loud that the trembling prisoner in his cell heard it, and broke out into a cold sweat when he quickly realized what it meant. He was to have a dose of justice in the raw. "'What shall I do?' asked the jailer. "'Give up the keys?' I don't know what to do, cried the sheriff despairingly. Would there be any use in speaking to them, do you think? Not the slightest. I ought to call on them to disperse, and if they refused, I suppose I should have them fired on. That is the law, answered the jailer grimly. What would you do if you were in my place, appealed the sheriff. It was evident the stern Roman father was not elected by popular vote in that county. Me? said the jailer. Oh, I'd give him the keys and let him hang him. It'll save you the trouble. If you have them fired on, you're sure to kill the very men who are at this moment urging him to go home. There's always an innocent man in a mob, and he's the one to get hurt every time. Well then, Perkins, you give them the keys. But for heaven's sake, don't say I told you. They'll be sorry for this tomorrow. You know I'm elected, but you're appointed, so you don't need to mind what people say. That's all right, said the jailer. I'll stand the brunt. But the keys were not given up. The clamor had ceased. A young man with pale face and red eyes stood on the top of the stone wall that surrounded the jail. He held up his hand and there was instant silence. They all recognized him as Bowen, the night operator, to whom she had been engaged. Gentlemen, he cried, and his clear voice reached the outskirts of the crowd. Don't do it. Don't put an everlasting stain on the fair name of our town. No one has ever been lynched in this county, and none in this state, so far as I know. Don't let us begin it. If I thought the miserable scoundrel inside would escape, 
If I thought his money would buy him off, I'd be the man to lead you to batter down those doors and hang him on the nearest tree, and you know it. There were cheers at this. But he won't escape. His money can't buy him off. He will be hanged by the law. Don't think it's mercy I'm preaching. It's vengeance. Bowen shook his clenched fist at the jail. That wretch there has been in hell ever since he heard your shouts. He'll be in hell, for he's a dastard, until the time his trembling legs carry him to the scaffold. I want him to stay in this hell till he drops through into the other, if there is one. I want him to suffer some of the misery he has caused. Lynching is over in a moment. I want that murderer to die by the slow, merciless cruelty of the law. Even the worst in the crowd shuddered as they heard these words and realized as they looked at Bowen's face, almost inhuman in its rage, that their thirst for revenge made their own seem almost innocent. The speech broke up the crowd. The man with the rope threw it over into the jail yard, shouting to the sheriff, Take care of it, old man. You'll need it. The crowd dispersed, and the sheriff, overtaking Bowen, brought his hand down affectionately on his shoulder. Bowen, my boy, he said, you're a brick. I'm everlastingly obliged to you. You got me out of an awful hole. If you ever get into a tight place, Bowen, come to me, and if money or influence will help you, you can have all I've got of either. Thanks, said Bowen shortly. He was not in a mood for congratulations. And so it came about, just as Bowen knew it would, that all the money and influence of the Pryor family could not help the murderer, and he was sentenced to be hanged on September 21st at 6 a.m., and thus public opinion was satisfied. But the moment the sentence was announced and the fate of the young man settled, a curious change began to be noticed in public opinion. It seemed to have veered round. There was much sympathy for the family, of course. Then there came to be much sympathy for the criminal himself. People quoted the phrase about the worst use a man can be put to. Ladies sent flowers to the condemned man's cell. After all, hanging him, poor fellow, would not bring Miss Johnson back to life. However, few spoke of Miss Johnson. She was forgotten by all but one man who ground his teeth when he realized the instability of public opinion. Petitions were got up, headed by the local clergy. Women begged for signatures and got them. Every man and woman signed them. All except one, and even he was urged to sign by a tearful lady who asked him to remember that vengeance was the Lord's. But the Lord has his instruments, said Bowen grimly, and I swear to you, madam, that if you succeed in getting that murderer reprieved, I will be the instrument of the Lord's vengeance. Oh, don't say that, pleaded the lady. Your signature would have such an effect. You were noble once and saved him from lynching. Be noble again and save him from the gallows. I shall certainly not sign. It is, if you will pardon me, an insult to ask me. If you reprieve him, you will make a murderer of me, for I will kill him when he comes out, if it is twenty-one years from now. You talk of lynching. It is such work as you are doing that makes lynching possible. The people seem all with you now, more shame to them. But the next murder that is committed will be followed by a lynching just because you are successful today. The lady left Bowen with a sigh, depressed because of the depravity of human nature, as indeed she had every right to be. 
The prior family was a rich and influential one. The person who is alive has many to help. The one in the grave has few to cry for justice. Petitions calling for mercy poured in from the governor from all parts of the state. The good man, whose eye was entirely on his own re-election, did not know what to do. If anyone could have shown him mathematically that this action or the other would gain or lose him exactly so many votes, his course would have been clear. But his own advisors were uncertain about the matter. A mistake in a little thing like this might easily lose him the election. Sometimes it was rumored that the governor was going to commute the sentence to imprisonment for life. Then the rumor was contradicted. People claimed, apparently with justice, that surely imprisonment for life was a sufficient punishment for a young man. But everyone knew in his own heart that the commutation was only the beginning of the fight and that a future governor would have sufficient pressure brought to bear upon him to let the young man go. Up to September 20th, the governor made no sign. When Bowen went to his duties on the night of the 20th, he met the sheriff. Has any reprieve arrived yet? asked Bowen. The sheriff shook his head sadly. He had never yet hanged a man and did not wish to begin. No, said the sheriff, and from what I heard this afternoon, none is likely to arrive. The governor has made up his mind at last that the law must take its course. I'm glad of that, said Bowen. Well, I'm not. After nine o'clock, messages almost ceased coming in, and Bowen sat reading the evening paper. Suddenly there came a call for the office, and the operator answered. As the message came over the wire, Bowen wrote it down mechanically from the clicking instrument, not understanding its purport. But when he read it, he jumped to his feet with an oath. He looked wildly around the room, then realized with a sigh of relief that he was alone, except for the messenger boy who sat dozing in a corner, with his cap over his eyes. He took up the telegram again and read it with set teeth. Sheriff of Brenting County, Brentingville. Do not proceed farther with execution of prior. Sentence commuted. Documents sent off by tonight's mail registered. Answer that you understand this message. John Day, Governor. Bowen walked up and down the room with knitted brow. He was in no doubt as to what he would do, but he wanted to think it over. The telegraph instrument called to him, and he turned to it, giving the answering click. The message was to himself from the operator at the Capitol, and it told him that he was to forward the sheriff's telegram without delay and report to the office at the Capitol. A man's life depended on it, the message concluded. Bowen answered that the telegram to the sheriff would be immediately sent. Taking another telegraph blank, he wrote, Sheriff of Brenting County, Brentingville, proceed with execution of prior. No reprieve will be sent. Reply if you understand this message. John Day, Governor. It is a pity it cannot be written that Bowen felt some compunction at what he was doing. We like to think that when a man deliberately commits a crime, he should hesitate and pay enough deference to the proprieties as to feel at least a temporary regret, even if he goes on with his crime afterward. Bowen's thoughts were upon the dead girl, not on the living man. He roused the dozing telegraph messenger. Here, he said, take this to the jail and find the sheriff. If he is not there, go to his residence. 
If he is asleep, wake him up. Tell him this wants an answer. Give him a blank, and when he has filled it up, bring it to me. Give the message to no one else, mind. The boy said, Yes, sir, and departed into the night. He returned so quickly that Bowen knew without asking that he had found the sleepless sheriff at the jail. The message to the governor, written in a trembling hand by the sheriff, was, I understand that the execution is to take place. If you should change your mind, for God's sake, telegraph as soon as possible. I shall delay execution until last moment allowed by law. Bowen did not send that message, but another. He laughed, and then checked himself in alarm, for his laugh sounded strange. I wonder if I am quite sane, he said to himself. I doubt it. The night wore slowly on. A man representing a press association came in after twelve and sent a long dispatch. Bowen telegraphed it, taking the chances that the receiver would not communicate with the sender of the reprieve at the Capitol. He knew how, mechanically, news of the greatest importance was taken off the wire by men who have automatically been doing that for years. Anyhow, all the copper and zinc in the world could not get a message into Brentingville except through him until the day operator came on, and then it would be too late. The newspaper man, lingering, asked if there would be only one telegrapher on hand after the execution. I shall have a lot of stuff to send over, and I want it rushed. Some of the papers may get out specials. I would have brought an operator with me, but we thought there was going to be a reprieve, although the sheriff didn't seem to think so, he added. The day operator will be here at six. I will return as soon as I have had a cup of coffee and will handle all you can write, answered Bowen without looking up from his instrument. Thanks. Grim business, isn't it? It is. I thought the governor would cave, didn't you? I didn't know. He's a shrewd old villain. He'd have lost next election if he'd reprieved this man. People don't want to see lynching introduced, and a weak-kneed governor is Judge Lynch's friend. Well, good night. See you in the morning. Good night, said Bowen. Daylight gradually dimmed the lamps in the telegraph room, and Bowen started and caught his breath as the church bell began to toll. It was ten minutes after six when Bowen's partner, the day man, came in. Well, they've hanged him, he said. Bowen was fumbling among some papers on his table. He folded two of them and put them in his inside pocket. Then he spoke. There will be a newspaper man here in a few moments with a good deal of copy to telegraph. Rush it off as fast as you can, and I'll be back to help before you are tired. As Bowen walked towards the jail, he met the scattered group of those who had been privileged to see the execution. They were discussing capital punishment, and some were yawning, complaining about the unearthly hour chosen for the function they had just beheld. Between the outside gate and the jail door, Bowen met the sheriff, who was looking ghastly and sallow in the fresh morning light. I have come to give myself up said Bowen, before the official could greet him. To give yourself up? What for? For murder, I suppose. This is no time for joking, young man, said the sheriff severely. Do I look like a humorist? Read that. First, incredulity, then horror overspread the haggard face of the sheriff as he read and reread the dispatch. 
he staggered back against the wall, putting up his arm to keep himself from falling. Bowen, he gasped. Do you, do you mean to, to tell me that this message came for me last night? I do. And you, you suppressed it? I did, and sent you a false one. And I have hanged a reprieved man? You have hanged a murderer, yes. My God, my God, cried the sheriff. He turned his face on his arm against the wall and wept. His nerves were gone. He had been up all night and had never hanged a man before. Bowen stood there until the spasm was over. The sheriff turned indignantly to him, trying to hide the feeling of shame he felt at giving away, in anger at the witness of it. And you come to me, you villain, because I said I would help you if you ever got into a tight place? Damn your tight place, cried the young man. I come to you to give myself up. I stand by what I do. I don't squeal. There will be no petitions got up for me. What are you going to do with me? I don't know, Bowen. I don't know, faltered the official, on the point of breaking down again. He did not wish to have to hang another man, and a friend at that. I'll have to see the governor. I'll leave by the first train. I don't suppose you'll try to escape. I'll be here when you want me. So Bowen went back to help the day operator, and the sheriff left by the first train for the capital. Now a strange thing happened. For the first time within human recollection, the newspapers were unanimous in commending the conduct of the head of the state, the organs of the governor's own party lavishly praising him, the opposition sheets grudgingly admitting that he had more backbone than they had given him credit for. Public opinion, like the cat of the simile, had jumped, and that unmistakably. In the name of all that's wonderful, Sheriff, said the bewildered governor, who signed all those petitions? If the papers wanted the man hanged, why, in the fiend's name, did they not say so before and save me all this worry? Now, how many know of this suppressed dispatch? Well, there's you and your subordinates here, and we'll say nothing about it. And then there is me and Bowen in Brentingville. That's all. Well, Bowen will keep quiet for his own sake, and you won't mention it. Certainly not. Then let's all keep quiet. The thing's safe if some of those newspaper fellows don't get after it. It's not on record in the books, and I'll burn all the documents. And thus it was. Public opinion was once more vindicated. The governor was triumphantly re-elected as a man with some stamina about him.